Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to Ellensburg, Washington, USA. The local time is 1144, and in about 15 minutes, we're going to be starting this lecture. So we're 15 minutes early, but we're live with folks. Can you hear me, those that are live with us? Thank you. Terrific. Wonderful. So let me uh, thank you. That's a relief. So I'll stick. Uh, so I'm talking now to people who are watching this in replay, and I'm just introducing this title slide here The Cordier and Ice Sheet, an ice sheet predisposed to outburst floods. Three authors, but our speaker today is Jerome Lessman, Earth Science Department, Vancouver Island University. But there's work uh, involving Joel Gombiner and Sky Cooley with this talk as well. Again, if you're watching this in replay, please scrub ahead 15 minutes, a full 15 minutes to get to the um, beginning of this lecture. For those of you live, thank you. And let me switch cameras and uh, we can say hi to each other a little bit. Hey, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. Let's check in. I'm glad that you can hear me. We're five by five, right? And uh, we're not even turning on Jerome's microphone yet. Uh, but let's say hi to some folks. Where are you viewing from? And then we'll eventually swing you around and have you enjoy folks in the room here. Hello, Yuki. And John's over in Cleelum, Washington. Carla has five by five. Marion, Virginia, Connecticut. Uh, Portland, Oregon. Chicago. OMAC, Buell, Idaho, Parma, Idaho, San Diego, Charlotte, North Carolina, Littleton, Colorado, another Colorado, Lincoln City, Oregon, Cowlitz County, howdy, buddy, Utah, Malaga Slide, hi, Sharon, Marinette, Wisconsin, Hansville, Washington, uh, BC, Washington, yeah, maybe we have a bunch of Canadian viewers today since we're hearing from a Canadian um, geologist, Indianapolis, Indiana, Tri-Cities, Washington. Z Yazira is in San Juan, Puerto Rico. Hello. Hello, Puerto Rico. Do we have other distant lands? I was late. It's been a busy week with Jerome. I was late posting this scheduled live stream. I did it this morning. So there's a chance that people are just not remembering about us because I haven't had this on my YouTube channel for a couple of days like normal. Don's up in Fairbanks, Alaska, Newcastle, Colorado, Rochester, Washington, Stefano in Italy. Hello, Stefano. Rachel said she'd love to be here. San Antonio, Texas. Dick is in the Netherlands, as usual. Lee is in London, United Kingdom. Ben's in the Netherlands, Kent, Washington, and so on. Okay, well, terrific. Um, let me say a couple quick things to you, especially if you live in the Pacific Northwest, and I'll be saying the same thing to everybody here in the room momentarily. Still nervous for some reason that we're working. I don't know why. <laughs> Can I ask one more time before we deal with Jerome, who's out visiting with folks? Oh, here he comes. Yeah, thanks, Doug. So some of you got a notification. Five, okay, thank you. Um, so... You'll hear me say this uh, to the live uh, crowd here in just a bit, but um, well, I'll say it right now. I'm going to live stream on Tuesday. I'm going to live stream from this room, and Jerome's going to be teaching Geology 351, and I'm going to live stream it. So I will schedule a live stream just like this, but it won't be... Um, I guess it'll be kind of like this, but it's just going to be my students. And I guess it'll be some folks who are sitting in as well. So I'm reminding you that if you want to drive to Ellensburg on Tuesday, this coming Tuesday, whatever that is, uh, 1 p.m., 1 p.m. in this room, 103 in Discovery Hall, you're welcome to sit in on the class. And we had a handful of folks who did that last Tuesday. Folks who drove in, visited Vinman's, I guess that's a requirement, and then joined us. Um, but otherwise, if you're way far away, you can certainly um, join us live, and I think we'll have some sort of expanded live Q&A. You know what? Oh, God, signs out of control. Let's turn you on. Oh, 
And uh, I'll just press and hold. Um, either we'll do an expanded live Q and A after Tuesday with the home viewers, or possibly after class, you mean? After or class, during? Yeah. Or possibly we do just some sort of just a thought right now, like some other separate live stream Monday or Tuesday morning, and yeah. it's just you and I, like. Sure. Nothing but it. just sure. like you know, especially after they hear today and they and they see what I'll post what you did last Tuesday on class, yeah. Uh, and a bunch of them know you already, yeah. But in fact, why don't you come on? Okay, that sounds good. A bunch of you know this guy, are we on there? oh, yes, we are from the Baja BC, from the crazy Eocene, and uh, other things. Hey, everybody, it's hard to know who's on, but maybe I'll recognize names. Oh, can yeah, you hear, look at that. Can you hear Jerome? Jerome can say hi to a few of these guys. You know, you recognize a bunch of these. Guys. Oh, yeah, for sure. For sure. <laughs> Great. Well, nice to see everybody. I'll see see everybody. Yeah. <laughs> Los right. Angeles. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah, so that's great. Let's do that Tuesday during your I after class. So. Yeah, perfect. That works for me. Well, we'll see how many we have that just yeah. kind of stick around after class. But if it kind of morphs into this, Q &A or, something. Uh, or maybe I even project, would that even work? That's a thought. I could I could project the, the questions. Oh, yeah. Or the yeah. live chat somehow. I don't know. I'll think about that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That sounds good. Good. Well, Let's we'll, try we'll that. keep you on. Okay. Uh, we got 10 minutes. If you're watching this in replay, you got 10 minutes before we start. Can I ask one more time, especially for Jerome? Is he loud and clear, especially when he talks loud to the back of the room? Is he too loud? Somebody said more than might be too loud if I'm really uh, belting it out. We can we we can simply just, you know, just lower it. Lower you a little bit. Okay. Yeah. How about this? Plenty loud and clear. That should be fine. That's just okay. Brian. <clears throat> perfect. They saying you're perfect. There we go. Okay. You can't argue when somebody says you're perfect, can you? <laughs> All right. Okay. Okay. Well, Good. I'm going to circle. Uh, your, so whatever you say from this point forward, they're going to be able to it's, hear you. It's forever. Uh, that's no problem. Yeah. And uh, thanks, everybody, for joining us one more time. Nine minutes from now, we're going to start the program. But I'm just going to move the camera, give you a sense of the room, and we're just going to visit a little bit. Okay. <laughs> How you doing? You ready to roll? Yeah, it's nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. I've seen you now. It's always the same thing. It's nice to meet you, though. It feels like you know people, but it's nice to meet you. <laughs> I feel that way about a lot of people I know. in this. Yeah, I know. It's such an it's such an interesting uh, whatever relationship or I can't figure out how it works, but it does. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, no, it's great. Yeah. When do you go home? Uh, not for another week and a bit more, probably. Actually, yeah, a week or so, maybe even a bit more than a week. Getting over the border, a piece of cake. Mostly. Yeah. Yeah. Is it easier going the other way? Usually, it's easier going home. Yeah. yeah. Welcome back. Yeah. <laughs> Instead of you, you were yes, really what do you want? What are you doing? <laughs> Marshall of Tuesday. What are you bringing in? Everything you know, organized. That, that kind of was, did it become too so much? So it's the Cordelia. Like, like, how am I supposed to do all this? Today? Yes. Um, we're yeah. gonna get to the very end of the cord with Thank the you. melt water. And oh yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Right to the end. Circle. Literally, Literally and figuratively. You killed it. Wow. Your dad's speaking now. Apparently. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like it's one of those that you kind of go, oh yeah, that, sure we can do that, and then and then you get to the 24 hours leading up to it, and it's like, oh my god, what did I just agree to do? Oh, it could still be this. Oh, we could use these kinds of signs. Right. Oh, let's make a board for this. Right. Like, oh, we don't have any boards. Well, there's a box here. There right. we go. Good. So you, it was worth it. Like oh, you, you didn't. There wasn't a moment you're like, oh my god, we we did all this and there's hardly anybody here or whatever. Oh no, there was five hundred of little hands everywhere. Yeah. Too many children, but it Too was many. really good. It was definitely worth it. Good. Well, good job. Yeah. Yeah. 
Bill. Just trying to find the camera. There's like. Get it, get on there. Oh, yeah, get on there. Okay. Good to meet you, Anna. Yeah. How are you? Good. How are you doing? Good. Great. What are your plans? I think today? we've got the plan sorted. I think this. I know that how to advance the slides and. Oh, okay. So you're all set. We're all set. Everything's good. He said, "Don't touch this. Only touch that." Yeah. That's what it. Time I lifted that blanket? Yeah. Yeah. I won't. I'm not even. I'm not even looking at it. Okay. And then are you going to go venture somewhere this weekend? Yeah. So we were out. Um, yesterday with the students in the field for field trip, and then the day before we just did a our own little, well, big tour, but our own tour. And then I'm leaving probably tonight over the weekend till Monday. Got some sites of field work that I'm gonna you know, have a look at, and then uh, back Tuesday for another round of the class, and then uh, Thursday, Wednesday, Friday, I would again for more field work with other people. Mm -hmm. So yeah, just trying to. Yeah, bring it, yeah. pack it all in because you know, I, yeah. <laughs> um, yes, so, yeah, okay. lots of lots of organized scheduling, but it's great. It's just been a really good few days of, yeah, just sort of chatting about all sorts of questions and things. So, it's, yeah, it's kind of that you kind of need that. Oh, you know how it is. Yeah. You just sort of like pull in so many different directions that sometimes if you're kind of just thinking about one thing and there's nothing else around you. It yeah, it does. It's super fun. And your head's turning a million miles an hour for, yeah. So that's kind of where it's been. Yeah. So it's great like that. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly it. So, so yeah, yeah, great. I meant to tell you that sometimes, yes, so yeah, hanging yeah. after everybody goes, <laughs> and that's fine. I just keep putting them up here. Oh. So, I, I just print out new ones. I'm like, I, ah, I forgot again. I meant to tell you, I'm yeah. sorry. So, yeah, yeah, I think some of them are <laughs> the 351 students. <laughs> yeah, because so. Oh, so yeah, yeah. We, we were in the field yesterday together for some of them, and then I met some of them Hello, Tuesday and during the, the classroom nice. period. So, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. There we go. You guys feel like yes. How are you guys doing? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's great. Okay. It's really nice. Thank you for coming today. Yes, I did. No, no, I, no, no. I did. I did. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Right. <clears throat> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's a happy you turn up, but thought. Nick's got sort of this parallel. It is. Where did you guys come from? A group today? of people yeah. that just sort really? of, wow. you never know how many are going to show up, show up or are on. Okay? I mean, there's a whole pile of them online right now. Yeah. And it's just, okay. yeah. But I'm glad you're here. Yeah, yeah. Just, all right. <laughs> yeah. Whoa. Yeah. It's got such a following. Yeah. Hi, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's what an oh, oh yeah, me yeah, actually regularly. Thank you. I see you almost here every time. So I, I think that yes, means that people are hearing what we're saying. Hey, unless he unless he's turned it off. I'm not no, sure. I think which is better this way. Yeah. You just go right. Yeah. I saw that. That was great. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And it was like, whoa! I can't believe Nick and other faculty teach in this class. Oh yeah, yeah. I had that once years ago. I was teaching in Ottawa. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, intro classes mm -hmm. and, and big rooms like this. It's 400, it's like Crazy. tiered auditorium. You just like, like, how do you connect? Well, basically, the first three, four rows, yeah. right? And the and after that, it's sort of you try, but you try, but how do you do it? Yeah, awesome. yeah, it's a, it's a strange, uh, <laughs> not my preferred way of doing it. Let's just put it that way. Yeah. Can I ask one more time? Are we five yeah. by five, please? With yeah. me and Jerome? Yeah. Completely. One more check, five by five, with me and Jerome, and then we're going to start. Yeah. Thank you, you guys. Thank well, there's you. There's Carl.
I want to say hi. Yeah, right back, yeah. How are you doing? Good. Nice to see you. Good. Yeah. You guys have a good day yeah, it was great. Good. Really nice, yeah. Well, yesterday we went with the students, and the day before we did our own kind of loop. So, yeah, it was great. Good. It was uh, pretty gray and windy on Waterville, but, you know, we huddled on the lee side of a, a basalt bump and managed to do things. <laughs> Yeah, I bet. Yeah, yeah, that'd be great. We went up Foster. There's a lot of interesting things in Foster. You ready? Yeah. I'm gonna start. Okay. I've got about five minutes of words, and then we'll turn it over to you. Sounds good. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for being here. Um, we've got a full room today, and I understand why. This is a very special guest that we have, and we have a topic that's appealing to many, many people. So thank you for being here. I want to make sure, first of all, that you know that we have another talk next Friday. That's going to be Sky Cooley talking about Calcrete at Eastern Washington's Geomorphic Triple Junction. That's Friday, April 28th, right back here in this room. Then we take a week off. Then May, four, uh, May 12th, Carrie Gazes, who teaches here, is giving a groundwater storage talk. And then a few more Fridays, our last Friday talk of the spring quarter, the last Friday of regular classes, Max Nita will be talking about designing video game style field geology simulations for research and education. Okay, so this is the second of five spring talks, and we've had plenty of these now this whole academic year. So so great to have a full room. Thank you. We're going to introduce our speaker and get right into it, except I've got one more announcement. If you have not yet seen our department chair, Bree McGinnis, at the back of the room, and you have not filled out a form about giving permission to be on camera, then please check with her on the way out or just fill out a form on your way out. They might just be standing, sitting there by the doorway. This is the shadow zone where you guys don't want to be on camera. There's also a form there. But most of us have already done that at some point this school year, and that's fine. Okay, let's introduce our speaker and we get right into it. Jerome Lessman is from Vancouver Island University, Nanaimo, British Columbia. He's on sabbatical. He's been teaching geology up there for many years now. He's on sabbatical this spring. And months ago, he said, hey, I'm on sabbatical. I'm going to do some field work down here in eastern Washington, central Washington. And I said, great, I'm going to pick the Ice Age floods topic for the Geology 351 class. And so possibly we can involve you in the class. That's been happening. Jerome showed up on Monday night. He spoke to our 351 group on Tuesday. Many of us were out on the Mansfield channels way up north of Moses Cooley yesterday, shivering in the cold and the wind. Here he is today, and my, mention, my, my, my message is this weekend he's out doing field work. We're not doing our normal Friday afternoon uh, dinner down at Cornerstone Pizza because he's basically leaving town in a couple of hours, but he will be back. And if you want more of this topic with Jerome, Tuesday, next week, 1 o'clock, you're welcome to join us, Geology 351, in this room. There'll be plenty of open seats. Feel free to come back and listen. And always, you can visit after this session as well. And some of us might even walk over to lunch someplace. Okay, that's enough of an introduction. We want to get into this with Jerome. Can you please help me welcome Jerome Lesman, who is speaking? Oh, there it is. There it is. Let's go for it. All right, thank you. So um, the topic, I'm gonna to assume you're gonna put the yep, slide I got up. You. Slide coming Perfect. at you, coming at you. So the topic is on the Cordaire and Ice Sheet, something that's uh, rele very relevant to this region, but specifically, as you'll see, it's uh, an aspect of the Cordaire and Ice Sheet, which is really the hydrology of this enormous ice sheet. So I'm gonna focus very strongly on the hydrology. But before we get there, and as part of that story of hydrology, uh, the, the tendency for outburst floods, and I'm gonna make the case that really outburst floods are a very normal part of the cycle of an ice sheet. 
and for this region, that has some important implications in terms of how we understand uh, fairly recent geologic events, particularly as they relate to the area known as the Channel Scablands in the region. This is work that's this is sort of old work and ongoing work, and I've got colleagues and collaborators, Joel Gombiner and Sky Cooley. So um, this is, in many respects, a group effort that's uh, developing. Let's put it that way. We're not certain. We're not at a stage of having uh, a lot of pieces firmly set, but we're sort of thinking hard about some of these questions that I'll present today. So the best way to get an introduction to the Cordillera Ice Sheet is to actually watch it grow and disappear. So we'll start that. These are computer simulations of the growth and decay of the ice sheet. I've truncated the timeline because it goes back 120,000 years. So we start around 40,000. And uh, this is driven largely by a temperature record that leads to cold temperatures leading to the growth and uh, expansion of an ice sheet. But you can see, and we'll cycle it a couple times, but you'll see this is, we're firmly into the last glacial period here, full ice sheet phase where it's submerged the vast majority of British Columbia. And as this is the, the rapid retreat of the ice sheet, you see it's shrinking back to its original locations or um, disappearing from the landscape. We'll run it one more time and you'll see the Cordillera ice sheet is actually quite significant and different from other ice sheets, specifically like the Laurentide ice sheet that develops over a relatively flat bed. In the Cordillera, it's a very different story. It develops over many mountain ranges, and those mountain ranges are really integral to um, the, the cycle of meltwater that's going to be generated both during the growth and during the decay of the ice sheet. So you'll, you see it growing right now. It's emerging from the Rocky Mountains to so the coast mountains of British Columbia. These are the main accumulation centers and also in central British Columbia. And as it grows to a critical size, it starts to migrate southward. This is the northern Washington and the Columbia River. So we're looking at the fringe of the ice sheet, and this is in the phase of retreat and a very rapid retreat of that ice sheet. More sort of cartoonish representation looks something like this. A here at the top is the, the phase with no ice sheet, the onset of glaciation, and we grow the ice sheet from um, cirque glaciers at high elevations that become large valley glaciers that feed trunk valleys. This is in B. And at some point, and for a relatively short duration through the glacial cycle, we actually have a full ice sheet, truly an ice sheet that submerges most of the topography. You'll notice very, uh, I think easily you'll see that when we're in the full ice sheet phase, there are very uh, uneven distributions of ice. Ice is very, very thick over deep valleys like Okanagan Valleys and many others, the Rocky Mountain Trench, but it's relatively thin over the highest summits. And this is an important uh, distribution or pattern of ice thickness because it's going to condition how the ice sheet disappears or deglaciates. So that as the ice sheet starts to melt, we'll expose the summits, these areas of thin ice first, and we'll preferentially isolate and um, preserve or the, 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 the deep ice sorry, the deep valleys with thick ice will outlast the thin ice on the summits. And so during deglaciation, we produce lots of meltwater. And we also trap this meltwater behind pieces of ice that are left behind in the deep valleys. Another way of thinking about what happens during a glacial cycle is not just in terms of how much ice appears on the landscape and then disappears, but it's thinking about the, the cycle of water production that accompanies the growth of an ice sheet. Because an ice sheet fundamentally even during its growth phase, and even at glacial maximum, will continuously produce meltwater. There's always some, season, some amount of seasonal melting. That production will ramp up as the ice sheet starts to melt and, de and deglaciate, but even during its growth and at its maximum, there's meltwater being produced. And so that cycle has been uh, represented and generalized as this curve, so we can see the ramping up the meltwater production. But for us, as part of that thinking about meltwater and the hydrology of an ice sheet, we can also incorporate in that thinking the occurrence of yokelaups. And yokelaups are an Icelandic word for outburst floods, so very sudden releases of stored water. And what we can infer or look at and see from this diagram is that there's an inverse relationship between the frequency and the magnitude of yokelaups during the growth of the ice sheet and also during the decay. So during the growth, as the ice sheet is getting larger and larger, we initially have a high frequency of yokelaups, yet the solid black line here shows us that the magnitude, so how much water is released, is relatively low. As the ice sheet grows in size and becomes increasingly uh, more able to store that water simply because it blocks more valleys and it grows, it's larger and larger, the frequency of these yokelaups decreases. So they don't happen quite as often because the ice sheet is just better at holding in the water. But when they do happen, 
because outburst floods are really about exceeding a threshold of retaining water. When they do happen, they tend to be really big ones. So better efficiency at storage, but occasionally you still release. And when you release, you've been storing for a while, so the yokel up is very large. And then that relationship flips itself during deglaciation. So we'll focus a lot on these different parts of the glacial cycle, thinking about the hydrology that accompanies the growth of the ice sheet. But I'll start with this middle part. And the middle part here is interesting because it represents sort of the glacial maximum, when the ice sheet is biggest. And one component of the hydrology that's not represented in this diagram is our ability to store water underneath an ice sheet. Most of this is thinking about in terms of water produced in front of the ice sheet, stored temporarily in side marginal lakes or in front of the ice sheet. But there is certainly a possibility for storage of water beneath the ice. So think of them as a, a large reservoir or a pocket of water under a large ice sheet. So let's go there for a second. Most of this is going to be re referring to or um, drawing examples from different field areas that we've been working in. I'll start with and focus a lot on Okanagan Valley. And today I'll really talk about three major groups or sets of landforms, what we call tunnel valleys, areas that are, that are large bedform fields, and then also uh, a third type of landform that we think we can associate with uh, large outburst floods, what we'll call ice block scours. And we'll sort of go through these one by one. But we'll start with the tunnel valleys first. If we look at most glacial landscapes, Tunnel valleys, which are, um, think of them as large conduits or channels or valleys. Tunnel valleys are valleys that are formed in contact or in relationship with an ice sheet. So they're valleys that are carrying meltwater and they carry meltwater underneath the ice. This is really important. And we know that they carry meltwater underneath the ice because quite often those channels or those valleys have profiles that tell us that the water is under pressure and is capable of climbing an adverse slope. In other words, it's not a regular gravity-driven drainage like you have for a river system that's subaerial, but when it's subglacial, there's an added component of pressure exerted by the ice. It allows us to climb basically uphill or go down to a, a trough and come up the other side. So these lines, the black lines that you have there, are the long profile, the elevation change along a certain distance of these two canyons cut into bedrock. And those two canyons, so you can look at yourselves, I'm going to have to move over for the cursor. Those two canyons are, there we go, in the Canadian, my side of the Okanagan Valley. They're right on this point here. Oh, oh. Can't do it backwards. Right here. So there's a set of these tunnel valleys cut into bedrock. They're, the elevation change shows us the water has to go uphill and downhill on the other side. Another set that I'll show you immediately is a bit further down the Okanagan, on your side of the Okanagan, right around Omak, uh, this area. And these plots, the blue lines here, are for Omak Lake area through here, the yellow line. And then on the other side of the, uh, the Okanagan, this area called Soap Lake. And you'll notice right away that the long profile of these channels is very irregular. It goes uphill, downhill. In some cases, it goes downhill quite a bit and then climbs up the other side. That's the telltale for a subglacial channel because we, we must have this extra component of pressure to drive the, the flow of water uphill. So we've got tunnel valleys up north of uh, the Okanagan, the northern portion of the o Okanagan in Canada. We've got tunnel valleys in the same valley system uh, around Omak, closer to the margin. Really, the view is that Okanagan Valley itself, the entire valley, is effectively operating as a large tunnel valley. And there's some clues to that if we start looking at the seismic profiles of the valley itself. One of the striking aspects of this valley is that first it's extremely deep. It's, um, I can't see on this with the, my picture, there we go. Uh, the, the depth of water and especially the depth to bedrock is, is hundreds of meters. And there's a very thick fill of sediment, but surprisingly, it's relatively simple. Its architecture is actually sort of a three-part architecture of gravel, sand, and a bit of lacustrine material. It's not an area we might expect for such a deep valley that's been around for such a long time to have a really complex fill. That it's basically a regional sink for sediment, so it's, uh, we might expect it to preserve uh, long-lived sediments, but in this case, it doesn't. It seems to be preserving very thick but uh, simple architecture of fill, and that fill of, of gravel, sand, silt Lacustrian silt has been interpreted to be mostly late Wisconsinant, so remarkably young 
for such an old valley. So the idea is that the valley acts as a giant conveyor for water into the ice sheet, and periodically it gets refilled, or we deposit sediment in that valley uh, subglacially. The story of Tunnel Valleys continues beyond these two locations. We're now going to the southern point, or southern, very near the southern margin of the Okanagan lobe of the Cordillera Ice Sheet, still in line with the Okanagan Valley. And this is a map you may have seen. This is some of the more recent work that um, I've been doing with Joel Gombiner. There's the map, and the 351 students will see and, and recognize this map. The blue channels are just that. They're channels spread across the entirety of uh, the Waterville Plateau underneath, again, underneath the Okanagan lobe. The light blue line is the margin of the Okanagan lobe. And the telltale for a tunnel valley, as we said, is some form of adverse slope that we can overcome. So that's what that colored line is, the red changing colors. That is a topographic divide. So what we're seeing is that these channels in many places and sometimes multiple times are crossing topographic divides, exactly what we expect out of subglacial channels that form when the water is pressurized. I won't say much more about this, but um, this is an ongoing work and it's really almost a presentation in itself about this map. But for us, this is providing an answer to the origin of Moses Cooley for us that we feel is uh, more appropriate or um, a bit more, well, better effectively than the, 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 re the existing explanation, which really uh, invokes diversion of water into the Cooley. The biggest question with Moses Cooley, one of the biggest scabland channels, is that it's not efficiently or not well connected to sources of water from Montana uh, that are usually invoked to explain the origin of other Cooleys like the Grand Cooley. For us, Moses Cooley is actually much better explained as a product of focusing of subglacial water that is initially flowing across the entirety of Waterville Plateau. And I'll just leave it at that for that part of the, the story. So you may ask yourself, so how do we, if we have all this water moving down the Okanagan, how do we generate it? How do we store it? Where does it come from? So there are different ways of thinking about this. Um, one model that we've proposed is that, in fact, what we do in, in sections of the Okanagan is we trap it, and we trap it early during the glacial cycle. This is what's called the Catch Lake model. It's been proposed for places like the Altai in Siberia, where there's, there have been other outburst floods. And the Catch Lake model uh, proposes that as the ice sheet is growing, if you can think back to the animation of the ice sheet growing from high summits and focusing in on the lower elevation or just the, the vertical cartoon, we've got ice emanating from high areas, focusing in, in the trunk valleys. But if these trunk valleys already have lakes, which they tend to do regardless of glaciation or not, then it's possible if the water is deep enough that we can have ice floating, effectively creating a bit of an ice shelf. And we coalesce this ice moving in from the high elevations over the lakes in the valley bottoms. And that basically becomes a trap or a catchment. So this is the idea of the catch lake. So we seal off a lake early in the glacial cycle, and then we continue to build the ice sheet on top of it, but we start off with a pool of water. That's one way of thinking about it. We don't necessarily start off with a completely dry valley covered in ice where we have to build it from scratch. We can actually start with an existing amount of water by trapping that body of water during the growth of the ice sheet. You can ask yourself, does it make sense to be generating lakes under the ice in the Cordillera? And the answer from different angles is, I think, a yes or a very possible. Uh, some of these are just examples of some of the modeling results of where we expect water to, to collect or pool uh, under an ice sheet. So there's a, a basically a, a hydrological model that includes the effects or the pressure of an ice sheet on the landscape, and it's predicting where we might expect to find water pooling. So at very coarse resolution, we're seeing development of major subglacial reservoirs across the the Canadian landscape in this case, but across the Laurentide ice sheet and parts of the Cordillera. And the area we're talking about is this one here. So there's a, an, a potential for a pool. There's, let's call it just a, a hydrological likelihood of a pool of water forming that location. And very similarly, if we focus in a bit or look at a model for something at a higher resolution, specifically on Okanagan Valley, then we see that it's also predicted to be an area of accumulation. Other lines of evidence uh, that support this is the fact that if we look at particular zones of Okanagan Valley, this is really much focused on Canada, but there may be similar situations below the border, but along the axis of Okanagan Valley and then a bit beyond, but that are hydrologically connected, these are areas of enhanced geothermal activity. There's just a natural high thermal uh, geothermal heat flux in these zones. Some of these are related to Eocene, 
uh, volcanic systems. There's also a whole set of subglacial volcanoes that are shown to have erupted around the time, a little early probably during the glacial cycle, but it's areas of very high geothermal activity, all susceptible of sort of helping the process of generating water at the base of an ice sheet. So our catch lake, if we initially seal it, may also be, we can accelerate the process just because that area is warm. And warm under an ice sheet means water production. So that's kind of the, the component of the hydrological cycle and what the focus in that might be related to subglacial storage of water. And it is something that, um, if we want to think about the, lake, the life cycle of an ice sheet, might be something that we generate early on. If you, I'll go back a slide. So this is during the onset of glaciation. As we start building the ice sheet, we trap water underneath. This may outlast through glacial maximum and at some point would release. And the evidence for the release is really in the occurrence and the connectivity that we have, this regional connectivity of tunnel valleys. Let's look at other forms of, or other sort of components or manifestations of the hydrological system of the ice sheet. These probably more associated with deglaciation. So we're moving past glacial maximum, moving into the, a period where we expect lots of meltwater production during deglaciation. And I'll just sort of step back a bit and just show you two very evocative images. One is the giant Quincy bar or West bar as it's known. It's one of the most famous scabland or channel scabland forms. It's one of the best giant uh, bar with hosting giant bed forms. Sometimes you see giant ripples, but that's probably not really the appropriate term because not really ripples, but giant bed forms. And I'll keep using that that word, they're, they're evocative. Basically, giant bed forms mean enormous flows. We just need really energetic, deep, fast-moving flows to generate these bed forms at that scale. Uh, this is in the entirety of the channel of one of the, the, the Columbia River. So it's orders of magnitude bigger than any other um, current, let's call them normal, the current uh, bars that are in the Columbia. And this is not a unique form. The red dots show you some of the most famous ones, but Vic Baker, who did some work on these bed forms in the 70s, recognizes and proposes that there's probably over 100 locations where these bed forms occur. They are part and parcel of the you know, highly energetic flows that move through the channel scablands. And there are very few landforms in the channel scablands that probably, I hate to use the word smoking gun, but I guess I will. It's, it's so clear the association between the process that creates these and the form that results it's kind of unmistakable, and very few people quibble about what these mean. They just mean big magnitude flows. Let's just keep it at that for what we're going to say going forward. So giant bed forms are basically diagnostic of mega floods. And mega floods for us, as we speak about this, the, the simplest definition is thinking about flows that reach discharges of 10 to the 6 meters cubed per second. That's sort of the agreed upon threshold at which we call something a mega flood or just below. So I'll show you some examples of features that are associated with mega flood or almost mega floods. Discharges that don't quite creep above the 10 to the 6 threshold, but are awfully close in some cases. So the, the bed forms in question I'll show you. These are the tunnel valleys of the blue stars. The uh, bed form fields, these are new, let's call them new to us anyways, in terms of discoveries or inventory of interesting bed forms. I'll, really point out something critical to this. All of these yellow stars are locations where we have large bed forms. All of these yellow stars are locations that are outside of the channel scablands. Okay, so these are large bed forms, not, basically not on these maps, not within the flood paths of the Missoula floods as they're currently recognized. So beyond the channel scablands. And then we'll also look at some obstacle scar marks in a minute that are also beyond Everything is, you can see here, is at some point under the ice or exposed as the ice is retreating, but is not part of the inventory of large bed forms associated with the big high magnitude flows of the channel scablands. So let's look at these. And I'll kind of do a bit of an inventory and we'll, we'll think about what they mean. So LIDAR has been an absolute boon for this kind of work and, and the ability to recognize very often subtle uh, terrain forms or landforms. This one is near OMAC, Washington. You see a beautiful example of very large bed forms. You see the undulations. So we have flow from top to bottom on this image and the unmistakable pattern of these transverse forms that repeat themselves at very even spacing. That becomes sort of the, the, 
the recognizable characteristics of these bedform fields. One example there, again in the Okanagan, just so OMAC is in the Okanagan. This is just at the confluence of the Okanagan and the Columbia, another set of interesting bedforms near Mons, some around OMAC Lake. I was just talking about the OMAC Valley with the subglacial channels. This is a, a, on the floor of one of these channels, another set of bedforms. We can move, in this case, away from the Okanagan towards the Spokane River Valley. Beautiful example, again, of large bed forms. These two blown up areas, these two yellow squares, uh, the ones on the right. So we, we see that recognizable repetition of ridges that uh, are the hallmark of these giant bed forms. This one in particular is associated with a big cataract, a big bedrock channel that's been eroded as well. A strange one, but another one, repetition. This is just west of that last image near Loon Lake um, in Washington. And this one in particular is in British Columbia, again in the Okanagan Valley, but just north of the border, uh, just south of the city of uh, Penticton. So they're nice images, but what do we get out of these? One thing we can do with these bed forms, and this has been done in the Channel Scablands, is establish relationship between some of the, the morphological parameters, the height of the bed forms, their spacing, and we call that the cord length. Um, and relate those to some of the flow parameters, the hydraulic flow parameters. So there are relationships established from the fields of bed forms in the channel scablands. This is the work of Baker, so I'm reusing his diagrams. And in this case, we're able to basically, from the ripple cord length, so from the spacing of the summits or the troughs of the bed forms, we can infer or estimate something about the velocity of the flows that are producing these forms. So all I've done is take all these, this inventory of bed forms, plot their morphologic parameters like the cord length on the existing graphs, and we're seeing that they, first of all, plot within the range of values that are associated with the flows that create the large bed forms in the channel scab lands. So we're creeping into the magnitudes of flows that are producing bed forms in the channel scab lands. Granted, we're on the low end of things, but we're still likely looking at some fairly high magnitude flows associated with those bed forms. Um, if you want some velocities, 20 to 35 feet per second. This is sort of the inference from the hydraulic parameters. This is probably the, um, the average, and we might be looking in some cases on the high end up to 50 feet per second, just from the plotting of some of the, the cord length. We can do something similar about the depth of flow, an inference of the depth of flow from the relationships established from the bed forms and the scab lines. Again, we're beyond that, we're not in the scablands, but we're looking at bed forms that have flow magnitudes that are approaching those of the scabland flows. So again, depth of flow, if you think about these fields, 40 to 50 feet deep in terms of water, in some cases, uh, past 100 feet, and maybe creeping close to 200. So these are not trivial outpourings of water to create such large bed forms. So if we've got some idea of velocity, sometimes depth, we can actually start estimating and I'll really emphasize the fact that these are kind of ballpark or back of the envelope, first order estimates. We're just trying to get a rough idea of magnitudes we might be dealing with. And that last component to, to estimate the discharge gets tricky because we really need to understand the evolution of the landscape to come up with reasonable numbers. Let me give you an example. This is the first example I showed you in your OMAC. We'll just take that as, a, as an example. If I ask you, what's the width of the flow that creates these bed forms? Well, we could be very conservative and say, probably the width of the bed form field. We'll just take the, the width of the field and say that's the width of the flow. So in this case, we're looking at a flow width of about 700 meters. But these bed forms are clearly on a terrace or on a surface, and that surface may have extended further. And there's a nice scarp here. So is the flow width actually 1,200 meters when the bed forms are created? Or was the terrace continuous across the whole valley and it's actually two kilometers wide. So there's a lot of uncertainty in trying to calculate or estimate a discharge from the parameters. So we'll just sort of, we'll just deal with an envelope of values to just give us an idea of the range. And where we, oh, what we end up with are discharge estimates of 10 to the four creeping close to 10 to the five. So not scab land, not mega flood scale quite yet, but still fairly significant flows coming through this this reach of the Okanagan Valley. Similar uh, process for those around uh, Penticton in British Columbia. This is the, the bedform field. 
Again, knowing about the landscape helps us constrain the flow. So just so you know, because you've probably never been there or realized, the brown area is a bedrock. The bed forms are this area. So this image that you see is actually this sliver or this little pocket of sediment. One of the questions is, is the flow width half a kilometer because there's a potential for stagnant ice? So is the basically are the flow sneaking between the bedrock and the ice? Or is it full width of the channel or the valley because the ice is either not there or not really consequential in trying to direct the flow. So again, a range of values. But this one on the high end is actually creeping into mega flood magnitudes. Last example of what we would call uh, paleo yokelaups or paleo outburst indicators. And I'm going to take you to Iceland to make this case because Iceland is a really good analog and example where we can uh, glean some information about the processes during these big outbursts. So in 1996, there was um, a volcanically generated Jokulaup. So in Iceland, this is a common feature. There are volcanic eruptions under an ice cap. It generates lots of meltwater. It creates a subglacial reservoir. And the water is, uh, exits through or transits through the glacier and underneath the gla glacier. So it's subglacial for a duration. And it emerges at the front of the glacier and builds this huge sander, or this huge outwash surface called Skeletor Sander. This is this big outwash surface here. These flows are enormously energetic. This is the ring road around Iceland and the bridge gets blown out regularly when these yokelaups happen because of the flow velocities and the transport of icebergs. So they're very destructive, but these flows are um, probably helping us, well, they are helping us understand and reconstruct past events because we can almost measure some of the parameters in real time when these, these events happen. To put things into perspective, that 96 yokelaup has a discharge of a peak discharge of five times 10 to the four. I showed you examples of bed forms that are 10 to the five and maybe 10 to the six. And even during a 10 to the four meters cube per second high energy event like that 96 Yokolaup, there's so much sediment transport during that event that the sander is estimated to have thickened by about nine meters in two days over an area of 500 square kilometers. So this is at that magnitude of event, this is how much sediment and how much work, geomorphic work, we can do to modify the landscape. And yet we're in the range of discharges that are just at where we infer from our bed forms. And the bed forms suggest even more energetic flows. One of the um, features that is generated during these big yokelaups, I don't care if I have it. Yes, I do. We're going to focus on this area. And you may, may or may not be able to see that really well. But if you can squint perhaps, or if you see it better than I can from here, the sander, the outwash plane, is full of little pockmarks, full of little depressions. And every depression there seems to have a bit of a, a loop or a bit of a horseshoe around it with two little tails emanating from the depression. Those depressions are the result of icebergs or ice blocks rolling on the sander, transported by the flow during the outburst. And some of them ground themselves or can't be transported very, very long, so they end up dotting the sander surface while the flow is still moving over that surface. And what we see with these little arms or these little horseshoe scours is erosion around the obstacle created by the ice block. It looks something like this. There you can see the depressions. I think you can see the, the wings of the little moats around them. And during the event, or sh shortly after the event, there's a, a stagnant ice block at the top you can see the depression carved around it. And you're seeing here sort of the, the downflow extent that creates these little uh, moats or depressions around. So a scouring, an erosion in response to an obstacle on the sander. When you're there in person, again, to appreciate scale, there's one of these depressions. There's two people there for scale. So picture that there was a, a block of ice partially occupying the space. It's obviously gone now. It's melted. But this is the scale of these pock marks you see on the sander. So they're very clearly associated with outbursts. And the fact that they have these erosional kind of scours or these little moats that extend downflow of the obstacle is something that is created during the outburst. So if we recognize them elsewhere, that might be a clue or a paleo outburst indicator for us. And in fact, we do. I'll take back to the areas we've already looked at. This is in the Okanagan, very close to just north of Omak, around the city of Tanasket. 
And many of the surfaces that contain some of the bed forms also contain evidence of these obstacle mark scours. And I think you'll see them fairly well on here. They're annotated with arrows, but here are the, the, a series of these little depressions or pock marks and the expected or the associated scours around the former obstacle that creates sort of these tails downflow of the obstacle. So we see them on that surface, we see them on this surface. And so they're probably indicative of a fairly high magnitude event releasing meltwater, but also transporting blocks of ice and flowing down one of these, in this case it's called horse spring coulee, flowing down one of these coulees and joining into the Okanagan. The examples there, a few other examples, just downflow, city of Okanagan, spring coulee this time, exact, exact same kind of geomorphic setting, a tributary valley or coulee joining the main, the main stem Okanagan, and on one of the terraces or surfaces elevated above the modern valley floor, we find these uh, depressions and the associated wings. In this case, I'm, I'm going to highlight them for you, but the, the divot, the depression is here. The wings are on this side here. So here's the depression, and the black lines are showing you the expected erosional wings to go with. So this is in the Okanagan. We'll take you back to central northern Washington around Kettle Falls, a place where we have the actual combo of both indicators. We've got the bed forms on one part of the surface, again, elevated side valley above the main stem, Lake Roosevelt, in this case, or Columbia River, and the scours with the trailing depressions from the, uh, the scouring. So the bed forms, these ice block obstacle marks, all probably fairly good uh, paleo indicators or indicators of paleo outburst because they're so closely associated with the hydraulic uh, conditions when they form. We have the Icelandic example that really helps us constrain their origin. We've got the uh, understanding from the Channel Scablands about the large bed forms. So a couple of um, just sort of points to make at this stage before we I start kind of wrapping things up. Those large bed forms that we saw and the, the optical mark scours, they all occur on fairly elevated terrace surfaces in tributaries. I've said that a few times, I think, uh, at this point. Those surfaces probably represent a temporary valley floor at a time prior to incision by, say, the modern rivers. So we're looking at uh, depositional surfaces. You can think of them, if you want, as outwash plains or sanders. And it's on those surfaces that we generate these large bed forms and other indicators of outbursts. We see that in the Okanagan, we see that in the Columbia, we see it uh, in a lot of places where we have the bed forms. What it's suggesting, because of where we find them and that association with these tributary valleys, is that the outburst responsible for creating these forms e occurs either in the main stem, so the main trunk valley, or somewhere in a tributary and delivers water to that main stem area. So there's sort of this focusing of water originating in side valleys, in many cases, and then uh, converging on the, the main stem, Okanagan or Columbia, whatever the location might be. How do we do that? Why do we have this pattern? I think that is really a function of the pattern of deglaciation. So it leads us to think about how the ice sheet is actually disappearing. And I'll call this irregular and patchy deglaciation, and I'll show you why that use of terminology. One of the bed form sets that I showed you, the one from uh, Penticton or from British Columbia, is associated very clearly with the drainage of a glacial lake. So a temporarily dammed lake at the end of the last glacial period, when we're moving into this phase of deglaciation where we said that we have stagnant bodies of ice that occupy the deep valleys, and behind those bodies of ice, we have ponded water. At some point, this ice dam is ruptured or is, is overcome, and the lake drains. And then in the Canadian section of the Okanagan Valley, one of these lakes is called Lake Penticton. And you can compare, because if you've been to the Okanagan around Kelowna and Penticton, this is what Okanagan Lake looks like today, 342 meters above sea level, roughly. But that is what Lake Penticton looks like. So if we can, can flip, oh, pardon me. Flip back and forth, will it go? No. You can compare the, the height of water. Basically, this is a much deeper lake because it's dammed be, uh, behind a block of ice. And this is the modern open valley lake that exists. That lake, when it drains, 
produces this train of bed forms. It's the drainage of this lake through this gap where these bed forms occur, right through here, that generates these bed forms. In this case, we're draining a volume somewhere between 75 to 125 cubic kilometers of water. So the lowering of Lake Penticton to its modern level is a release of about 75 to 125 cubic kilometers of water. But it's also doing it at a time or in a way where it's generating velocities and a discharge that is, at, from the inference of the spacing on the bed forms and the depth of water, is creating discharges that may well be reaching into uh, mega flood, the range of mega flood magnitudes. And perhaps the drainage of that lake is actually what continues down the Okanagan Valley and generates another set of bed forms that we see at OMAC. We're not clear on the source of that one. Speaking of the Okanagan, uh, south of the border, this is just one example of how we sort of start putting together these, these stories and this, this reconstruction of deglaciation in Apache fashion. So this is an area just north of OMAC called Tunk Valley. And if you enter or drive into these valleys, what you realize is that, first of all, they're very open. There's not much vegetation, which is great for this kind of work. And LIDAR certainly helps. But what we see is that the floor of these valleys is often a lacustrine fill. We can infer the presence of some kind of standing body of water in those locations just from the characteristics of the fill. And we also recognize that perched on the hillsides, often very high, and I've put some elevations there, are fans, big accumulation of coarse sediment, bouldery deltas, effectively. This is a, my interpretation of many of these. And also some shorelines that are etched on the, on the hillsides. And we can match the elevation so that one delta surface is corresponding to the elevation of a set of shorelines. So we're reconstructing effectively a water surface by correlating landforms that are indicative of a water plane, a delta, which grades to that water plane, and a set of shorelines, which is produced by waves on that water surface. And if we have a lake trapped in this valley, then we must have something to hold it because the valley is otherwise open. So we're gonna infer, uh, there's an inference here of the need for some amount of stagnant ice or some blockage of this valley. How much ice? The configuration, I don't know. I'm just, it's cartoonishly represented as a, a, a mechanism to dam it, but we're, if there's an evidence of a lake from the sediment and the landform, something has to block that, that valley. We can also recognize that some of these deltas and shorelines occur at different elevations, and we have this indication that these deltas are actually stepping down from different elevations. So the lake bodies are changing over time. They're draining to some degree, and it's perhaps in this episodic drainage that we're generating some of the flows that funnel down the main stem valleys that are potentially moving ice blocks, creating the scours and the bed forms. This is a pattern that is not unique to Tunk Valley. It's been proposed from the Metau, from the, the southern part of, the, of uh, the American part of the Okanagan. I've seen similar things or reconstructed similar processes north of the border in the Okanagan. And we can come up with all kinds of different configurations of how ice in relation to a water surface, but fundamentally it's the same general story. There's a source of water to build a lake, there's some kind of damming mechanism to retain the lake, and then there's an event where the lake disappears. And oftentimes that disappearance is a, is a fairly sudden drainage, particularly when you have an ice block that can be overcome. These are examples of field photos from uh, the Canadian side of the Okanagan. There's a big gravel delta here, you get an idea of the, the size of the delta and the the, the size of the four sets on that delta, but also on the outwash plain itself, lots and lots of large uh, dune scale strata that speaks to you know, energetic, deep, and fast-moving flows through these, these valley systems. So a couple of concluding thoughts on this whole uh, story of water production for the ice sheet. I think I can sort of put together, or just through some of the diagrams that I've been using, reconstruct a bit of the story. There's an expectation of water production as an ice sheet grows, comes to some kind of climax and then disappears. From the, the examples I've shown you, at the onset, we may be dealing with the beginnings of what will become a subglacial lake. So we're, we're storing a lot of this water and trapping it and building up the reservoir of water. When we release that reservoir, we're in the process of generating these tunnel valleys. So tunnel valleys, reservoirs kind of are associated and um, they speak to this subglacial drainage of water, not proglacial, not in front of the ice, but under the ice. The rest of the examples, and in this case, the, 
Waterville Plateau example is kind of the culmination of this entire process. And then during deglaciation, we may be generating some of these smaller magnitude events or smaller bed forms, more localized, but yet, yet or still very important in terms of their magnitude. Not quite mega, uh, mega flood scale, but significant nonetheless, and certainly capable of doing a lot of geomorphic work. So iceberg scour examples and large bed form trains in some valleys speak to this production and release of water, and that water may well be draining towards areas like the channel scablands, even though the bed forms themselves occur outside of the currently understood boundaries of the channel scablands, that water is uh, inevitably draining towards the channel scablands. What's more of an open question is, what's the record of outburst flood during the growth of the Cordillera Ice Sheet? And that's a very tricky question to answer because uh, it implies that we're able to preserve some of that through a phase of potential subglacial water production and release and also proglacial water production and release. So the, the landform record or even the sedimentary record of the of meltwater production during the growth is something that is um, certainly hard to hard to reconcile and hard to uh, interpret. We can think of that about this range of hydrological processes and trying to put it within the, the realm of what we know about the scablands. The bulk of the scabland events occur within that time envelope. We can go in terms of calendar years. That's probably the simplest. So dealing with events around 19 or 18,300 and most of the major scabland drainage events being done around 15 to 14,000. There are records, offshore records especially, of scabland drainage events that occur prior to the very well-documented set of drainages from Lake Missoula. In particular, a couple peaks, so this is mostly the offshore record. There's a particular peak of uh, offshore deposits associated with outburst floods around 24,000. That we don't have a very good record of this in the channel scabland area, but perhaps these are recording some of these subglacial drainages uh, related to reservoirs in the Cordillera Ice Sheet as we build these subglacial bodies of water and release them. And there's also another peak in production much earlier, around 28,000. So the, the ramping up of the ice sheet, as we said, will produce water. We may be trapping that water in many respects under a growing ice sheet, and perhaps the releases happen much before we start thinking about meltwater as a major geomorphic agent in the region. It's happening prior to most of the channel scabland erosion or transfer and transport of sediment in the region. And I'll conclude with this. Um, I hope if there's a takeaway from all this is that if we grow an ice sheet, we produce water. It's an expected part of it. It shouldn't be a surprise. And water production is not just a deglacial feature. It's not just when an ice sheet is decaying that we generate water. We generate it throughout the cycle. However, we're certainly gonna create more during the decay just because we have to melt the whole ice sheet. But even leading into glaciation, as we build the ice sheet, there will be meltwater being produced. Um, it's important if we start considering these different possibilities of the way that we might infer some of these hydrological events to recognize that in this case, what I've presented are basically two separate stories two separate sets of events, some that are subglacial, some that are happening during deglaciation that are most likely proglacial in front of the ice. Sometimes the difficulty in, is realizing that both these events are separate in time, they record different hydrological dynamics, but they play out over the same landscape. So the bed forms that we see in the OMAC area are formed in sediments that lie within the tunnel valleys that are produced much earlier subglacially. Does that make sense? I hope that makes sense. So there's this kind of coincidence of processes that play out in the same area. And sometimes that makes it very difficult to, for people to conceptualize two very separate set of events. I think we're getting an improved landform and sediment record of some of these events. The big bed forms outside the scablands are really intriguing just because of what they imply in terms of flow magnitudes and the direction of these flows towards the channel scablands. Same with the iceberg scours. Uh, I've given you some numbers, a reminder that they're just estimates. This needs a lot more work. I mean, there's a, more, a lot more thinking. These are just the beginning of our thoughts on this in terms of the hydraulics associated with some of these events. 
an open question is, if there's some kind of coincidence in time of these events, is there any major contribution of this water, in whatever form, subglacial, proglacial, to the channel scab lands? Is there geomorphic work done by some of these flows that is actually affecting the channel scab land and the Columbia Plateau area? Are we really dealing with potentially another or an additional source of water that explains some of the landforms and processes and events in the channel scab land? And this is really more than a plea than anything. Um, it's easy to think that the Channel Scabland story is sort of a, a story that's bookended and it's done and it's very clear. And I think that's not right at all. <laughs> There's a lot of open questions. There's a lot of interesting areas of research. So if this interests you, particularly if you're a student, uh, this is like a, this is fertile ground for new thinking, new ideas, new methods. If you like geochemistry, if you like geochronology, if you like quaternary things, landforms, whatever it is, there's room for everybody. There's a lot of interesting work to be done. There's a lot of questions still to be asked. And there's a lot of, uh, as we're doing a bit of this, you know, uh, improved understanding that's going to emerge out of this. So it's by no means a story that's been told and that's done. This is really, I think, an ongoing story. It's been ongoing for 100 years, and there's still some very fundamental questions that aren't answered. Thank you. Questions for Jerome, and he will repeat the question for mm. our home viewer. Yes. Yes, so the question is, did I go to Iceland to visit the Jokolops? Yes, I went to Iceland as part of a field trip dealing with outburst floods, looking at the, the fairly recent evidence of that Jokolop, and that's where we were able to take photos on the sander and so forth. Right. Prior in the U.S., since Iceland is kind of like how it used to look. Okay. So, is there anything? The question is asking effectively: Is there anything in Iceland additional features or aspects of the landscape created by Jokolabs in Iceland that helps us better understand what's happened here? Yes. yes. Um, well. Part of the Channel Scabland landscape itself is very much conditioned by the basalts that are there. They, they kind of condition the style of erosion and forms that we create. And it turns out that in Iceland, we also have basalts. So there's an even more correspondence there. And so some of the forms and the channels, there are very much cataracts that look a bit like some of the, uh, the coolies and cataracts of the Scabland in Iceland. From what I've uh, observed, and there's far more work being done by other people on Icelandic Jokolaups, the Icelandic record of Jokolaups informs us probably most about two things. One, the hydraulic dynamics of ponding water and releasing it. The, the hydrograph of Jokolaups is actually not uniform. It's not the same pattern every time. There are different uh, aspects of the hydrographs, and there are good reasons in terms of how the water is produced and how it's released. So the timing of release that, we, that generates the hydrograph is something that's uh, very informative. But also it's in the um, sedimentary products that are created on a sander. This is probably one of the more interesting parts because... We're dealing with magnitudes of flows in Iceland that are very hard to replicate elsewhere. It's very hard to model in a flume what happens when you move gravel through a flume at 40 kilometers an hour, because that blows up your flume. So these are almost like natural laboratories of very high magnitude events, very high um, concentrations of sediment. And you can go on the sander and you can see exposures of sediment and realize, wow, there are all kinds of interesting sediment transport processes that we can reconstruct from that. So that's probably one of the, 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 the areas that's most important or useful. And that has applications in the channel scablands because there's not just erosional landforms in the scablands, there's major depositional ones. So it helps us uh, have a better understanding of the, the, the sedimentary processes that happen. Okay. Yes. Is there any um, surviving evidence I see. Um, so the Cordarian ice sheet. What's the question? Oh, sorry. The question is: there any, Is there any offshore evidence of how far the ice sheet went? And the answer is yes, but it depends where you are. On in in Washington, the southern margin of the ice sheet is basically on the Columbia Plateau. It, it doesn't go to the ocean. The ice sheet, the Cordarian ice sheet, 
is in water, in the ocean water, on the west coast of Vancouver Island along the west coast. And, and yes, there is a bit of a record of the ice sheet encroaching and becoming a bit of an ice shelf in places uh, in the Pacific. But that's not um, so much part of the story in central Washington. But yes, there is a bit of a record. And there hasn't been as much study as, say, in the Atlantic, where you have an extensive record like Heinrich events. But there's a potential for similar events from the Cordillera and Ice Sheet. I don't think it's been sort of examined as to the same level of detail. Yes? So, so um, I talked to Nick about this a couple of different things today, but um, I was kind of exploring the uh, idea that maybe a lot of the, the Scatland yeah. and all the people there even absorbed before the uh, Kermasula was through. And I was just kind of wondering, um, like, maybe what's the likelihood of, of that? And have we done any research to sort of disprove that being a possibility? OK, so the question is, how likely is it that many of the coolies, the channel scabland coolies, are older or pre-existed the last glacial period, last glacial cycle, like the most recent glacial period? Um, I don't know. I think we spent three days talking about this amongst ourselves. So it's a definite possibility. There absolutely is ongoing research to try to resolve that question because if some of the major coolies are, in fact, already created beforehand, that changes the routing of meltwater from, say, Lake Missoula in a big way. And then you have to find other ways of blocking them if you want water to spill somewhere else. In this case, the, the best example of what you're asking is the Grand Coulee and whether there's ice blocking the Grand Coulee or not blocking the Grand Coulee or whether the Grand Coulee is, in fact, fully eroded to its, its northernmost extent. And I think you talk to different people, you'll get different answers. And so it's, an, it's a, absolutely an ongoing area of research trying to nail down the chronology of the opening. Uh, if if there are doubts about it. So, yeah, really good question because in many ways it changes some of the flood dynamics in the, in significant ways if one of these coolies is open already or not. Yeah. Chris. Jerome, I was wondering if you had any thoughts as to what evidence there might be to tell if you have um, stagnant ice still in a channel and other people were looking at some of these features, are they ice marginal? Yeah. Yes. Um, yeah. There. there What's we the can. Question? Th the question. Thank you. What's the evidence, or is there evidence for inferring stagnant ice or not, or how much stagnant ice might be in a particular location? I think that's what you're asking. So, the best example, or the most obvious piece of evidence we look for, are what we call kettle holes, or some kind of irregular topography that speaks to having ice buried partly in sediment and then melting and collapsing. So this irregular topography, and we see that irregular topography on some of these large terraces or benches in the Okanagan, in many places, but these tend to be isolated. The other challenge with this question in Okanagan Valley in particular is that the valley is relatively narrow. And so if we did preserve lots and lots of ice in the valley, then um, it would collapse. And we might expect the, the valley to collapse. And we see these big benches being pretty flat and so the area where the ice could be to collapse is pretty narrow. So that speaks to limited ice. But the kicker in all this is that the Okanagan River, the modern Okanagan River, has cut down and incised there. So if there's any evidence of this irregular topography, it's gone. So we're left sort of guessing at how extensive the ice could be. But when we, when we just do exactly what we just discussed, is look at the extent of these large flat benches or terraces, and look at the space that is potentially available to have stagnant ice, it's pretty minimal. But we also need to recognize that the amount of ice trapped in the valley is forever changing over time. It's melting, it's shrinking, it's getting smaller. So then it's the relative timing of when do we build the, the terrace? How much ice is potentially there? Was there more before? So is the ice blocking temporarily and then it's opening? See what I'm saying? It, it, there's, a, there's a time evolution to that landscape as it's forming that is uh, difficult to kind of nail down. I hope that answers the question, kind of. <laughs> a couple more before we kind of break into a smaller group. A couple more. There's one over there. Um, 
poor. So the, uh, the question is, are the beds of tunnel valleys likely to ex experience high pore pressure? Is that what you mean? They're going to experience high hydraulic pressure and forces if there's water moving through them. In fact, in some cases, you can actually erode. You can pluck hydraulically bedrock in some situations during fairly high uh, fast flow. So that might be something we expect. Um, sometimes we can have a tunnel valley forming in an, in an area where we don't necessarily excavate all of the bedrock. So there could be a pre-existing fill of sediment and we remove just some of it. So it's not always interacting with bedrock. It's very much, I think one of the diagrams that I showed you has both uh, a profile of the valley floor and a profile of the, I think, sediment surface, something like that. So no, sediment surface and then the bedrock surface. And in, in both cases, it's you know, going up an adverse slope. But we, you, not every tunnel valley is going to basically be bedrock floored. I guess is the short, <laughs> short and long of it. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Um. What's the question? Good question, Moses Cooley. How confident am I that the water comes from the Okanagan rather than Columbia? Well, this your question spills into the previous one of the previous questions about when does it form fully? Do we do it? So I don't know about those details. It might be something that's fairly long lived. What I'm confident about is I think I have a better uh, pattern of drainage from the subglacial structure leading to Moses Cooley than I can recognize coming from the Columbia. Does that work? <laughs> it's kind of non-committal, but at the same time. Exactly. There's this perpetual problem of connectivity to sources of water coming or connecting somehow to Lake Columbia or the Grand Coulee or some even Foster Coulee. I think it's, it's difficult. Uh, to me, that's a simpler that's a simpler drainage system that feeds into Moses Coulee more convincingly. Can we? Yeah. Sure. Yes. Okay. Hey, let's thank Jerome one more time, please. Thank you. Thank you for coming. We'll see you next Friday. If you have more questions, please come on up. We'll just kill the microphones and give you a chance to visit with Jerome one on one. Thank you so much. Press and hold. Yeah. Nice job. Thank you. Keep it on. For yeah. Sure. Yeah. Good. Hi. What you got there? <laughs> you brought this all the way in, huh? Oh, yeah. No kidding. Muffler ball. Muffler boy. Muffler boy. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you Another so much. There you go. Oh, that's beautiful. I'm still rolling here. I'm going to talk to these guys. Thank you so much. Okay. Thanks, everybody, for joining us today. Uh, I've got a couple quick announcements that I said right at the beginning, but I'm going to say again right now in case you weren't with us at the beginning of this. Um, I'm almost sure that we will live stream this Tuesday. I should have looked up the date. What's the date on Tuesday? 22nd, 23rd, 24th, 24th. April 25th. April 25th at 1 p.m. Pacific time. I will have a scheduled live stream. It will be from the same auditorium. It'll be the same speaker, Jerome Lessman. 
It's mostly going to be the Geology 351 students, but there's going to be plenty of people joining us from off the streets as well. And you are invited. So if you'd like to come and sit in, in the room and you want to deal with Jerome directly as he's doing with some of the local folks right now, that'd be terrific. If you want to join us with the live stream, that'd be great as well. Uh, but that's this Tuesday. What did I say? April 25th, let's hope. That's a Tuesday, 1 p.m. Pacific time. Otherwise, uh, I've got a couple other Jerome Lessman videos that I'll be posting in the next few days. We've been so busy that I haven't really had a chance to edit anything or look at it, but I'm, I'm pretty sure I captured it both in the field and in the classroom. So there's plenty of exciting things going on, plenty of exciting things to learn, and I'm hoping to share much of that with you in the coming weeks and even months. We'll just see how far this Ice Age flood thing continues to go. Okay, I think that's enough for today. Uh, Jeff from Vinman's is waiting to visit a little bit, as well as a few other folks who are uh, special visitors to the campus today. So thank you. I love you. And we'll see you next time. Goodbye from Ellensburg, Washington, USA. Yeah. So if there's subliquid channels, then you get some of these values really deep. Yes, and there's nothing in there right now.